welcome to Black Men Speak. I'm your co-host, J.R. Stewart. And good evening, everyone. I'm your co-host, Tommy Duncan. We want to give a special shout-out to Liquid for coming up with our theme music. Tommy, do you hear the theme music at the beginning of the show? On your side? Like, like, like. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we want to give a shout-out to a big thanks to uh, Liquid for... Uh, we're coming over our theme music. Um, so anyway, Tom, let's uh, let's get started. Um, oh, before we do, we want to uh, also ask that you, you know, that you subscribe, that you share, and you um, and like our channel and our videos. You know, please help us spread the word. Um, we're trying to grow the channel, and if we can pick up a hundred likes tonight. It would be great. We're on every Wednesday, 9 p.m. Central, live. So it's not pre-recorded and cut and paste. You know, I mean, we're here live, um, giving you our opinions and our views on uh, various topics. So who, who do we have tonight, Tom? Who are we talking about? Who's up tonight? We are going to talk about Claudette Coven. Claudette Coven, the the the, the actually the um, the first Rosa Park, um, not the uh, yes. yeah. So. Did not quite get the credit that was due her, and we can we're gonna get into that and, and see if we can't um, um, figure out why a history has neglected her all these years. But yeah, she was the she was a teenager at the time, and she was on the uh, bus, and of course we know the story of Rosa Park where she refused to give up her seat to a white person uh, in the front of the bus and go to the back of the bus where the quote unquote Negroes were uh, designated to sit. You're exactly right, Jimmy. Um, this is one of the, what I would consider, knowing what I know now, probably one of the most important civil rights figures that most people have never heard of. Yes. In the traditional conversation about civil rights in America. So before we get into it, Tom, we have a uh, short video that we want to play. So... Let's uh, play that for our watching audience, and then uh, we're gonna come back on the back side of the video and uh, discuss it. In Montgomery, Alabama, in March of 1955, a young woman was arrested for refusing to move to the colored section in the back of a city bus. That young woman's name was Claudette Colvin. She refused to go to her seat nine months before Rosa Parks. Colvin was only 15 years old when she was arrested. Unlike Rosa Parks, who was an NAAC officer and dedicated activist, Colvin did not have civil rights training and did not become a symbolic figure of the civil rights movement. To understand why so few people have heard of Claudette Colvin, we have to consider how her arrest was covered in the media at the time. Colvin was on the front page of the Chicago Defender, the nation's leading African-American newspaper. But her courageous stand against segregation was not deemed newsworthy by any national white newspapers. If journalism is the first rough draft of history, white newspapers were the first to write Colvin out of our nation's history. If you had traveled back in time to the 1950s and pick up a big city newspaper like the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, or Los Angeles Times, you'd have no idea that those cities had thriving African-American communities. While millions of African-Americans lived in those cities, the newspapers carried very little information about black people, and what they did carry were often sensationalized crime stories. Thankfully, African-American newspapers like the New York Amsterdam News, Chicago Defender, and Los Angeles Sentinel filled this void. Unlike mainstream white newspapers, African-American newspapers were dedicated to recording and sharing stories about the everyday joys, struggles, and complexities of black lives. The black press was a fighting press, and reporters and editors understood that they had to take a side on certain issues, such as civil rights. The legacy of black newspapers lives on through the work of black journalists, organizers, and activists on social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook. Much in the same way that black newspapers in the 1950s reported on the murder of Emmett Till, Today, many Americans learn about police shootings of black people through social media. These historical echoes are not accidental. Black lives mattered every day in papers like the Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier. And when African-American newspapers advocated for the humanity of black people, they also made it clear that white newspapers were not politically neutral. Media has always had the power to reveal or conceal different people, events, or histories. Like the story of Claudette Colvin, the stories that live in the archives of black newspapers can help us reckon more honestly with our nation's history. The history of the fighting press is important today because there's still so many things worth fighting for.
And so that was a short video on um, Miss um, Miss Claudette and the uh, story. And basically, that was a piece from I believe Arizona State University, really talking more about how the press neglected to cover the story and how they shaped the conscience by underreporting black news. And this, and basically pointing out the importance of having black newspapers. I'm not sure we have any more black newspapers these days, other than you know things that you find um, in, I guess, laundromats or or small stores or small restaurants, uh, little black publications. But I don't necessarily call those a newspaper. Well, well you know, we, we do, do have you know local newspapers in uh, you know several cities, cities, but to your, your point. point in terms of national publications, uh, maybe beyond um, the publication by the Nation of Islam, I think it was uh, called Muhammad Speaks, I've, I've forgotten what it's called now. I, I'm not aware that we have too many national publications that focus solely on the black community in print. Obviously, we have a lot of uh, digital, um, I wouldn't call them papers, but uh, we have digital platforms that we're using to convey the news that's going on, not just in our country, but around the world. Okay. Okay, let's get back to Miss Claudette. Um, a teenager, you know, back uh, at this time, uh, late 50s, maybe early 60s. What year was it? Do you know? 1955. Okay, the mid-50s then. Um, and this was a time that it was still, you know, um, you know wasn't, um, I mean, still a time when the Klan was still running wild and you know, black people still were not uh, totally free at that time, and you could certainly, you know, run the risk of white retaliation without any repercussions for them, but certainly could be harmed and harmful to you. So for her to refuse to give up her seat to a white person at that point, I could just imagine that um, that there were many who thought, well, maybe she was one out of her place and two, stepped out of the bounds of society. And certainly, I'm, I'm surprised there wasn't uh, any uh, backlash against her, no pun intended, um, to punish her in some way or to send a message. Well, you know, you, know, you bring up a very good point. First, you have to consider you're in Alabama. And we talked about Alabama then, um, not you know, extremely far off now, but Alabama was the hotbed of racial segregation in the United States. Let's just say in the South, and Alabama was a definite card-carrying member uh, with plenty of characters who were driving for segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. But uh, as it pertains to Ms. Claudette Colvin, um, you know, one of the things that strikes me so much after doing a little research about her story is that this was a 15-year-old student, a young lady, um, who was on a segregated bus uh, at the time. And she was in the so-called black section of the bus, but because a white woman came on the bus and there weren't any seats in the white section, the, 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 the law, the, the, the custom at that time said, you got to get up. And yeah. you got to make room for this woman because she's white, and she decided no. Well, you know what? We know that when Rosa Parks, um, you know, demonstrated her social disobedience to oppose the law, that was pretty much planned um, for her to do it. I mean, they they knew quite well that she was going to do it. She was going to be arrested, uh, and that was part of the plan. But when Miss Claudette did it. She was just tired. She, yeah. she, she was just and fed up that she wasn't going to take it anymore at 15. You know, it, you're right. This was not played. This was not staged. This was not planned. She was sitting in an area where she was supposed to be sitting until the seats ran out and a white woman got on the bus and the bus driver told her she needed to get up. And the interesting thing about this, Jimmy, is that there were three other women who got up and moved. Mm. There was a lady that, an adult woman who was sitting next to her on the bus, and when they told her to move, she said, no, I'm not, I'm not getting up. And Claudette Colvin said, you know what, I'm not either. 
And so the bus driver told, you know, a guy in the back, a gentleman, by the way, said, you know what, you need to move back so they can find some place to sit so we can get this, this white lady seated. Hmm. Well, the lady who was pregnant, the woman who was pregnant got up and left. But Claudette Colvin did not. She decided, you know what, I'm not moving. And she made a, a, a very interesting statement. She said, you know what, it was like Harriet Tubman was holding down one shoulder and Sojourner Truth was holding down the other one. I had been studying about, you know, fighting for your rights and something would not let me get up. And that was the beginning. Well, sometimes, Tom, uh, by sitting down, you're actually standing up. Um, and she certainly uh, demonstrated that uh, with her with her action. Um, like I said, I, I was quite impressed by reading her story. Now, I'd heard about uh, her years ago in an article that I'd read. And I didn't pay much attention to it at the time. Um, but I did read the article and I just sort of followed it away uh, until about a week or so ago you and I started talking about it. I think that you may have run across a story someplace because you yes. mentioned it, um, and that sort of uh, um, you know allowed me to you know to, to, to draw on my memory. Like, hey, I, I remember that story. I remember hearing about her, uh, or at least reading about her. And but she is definitely someone, Tom. That I'm not going to necessarily say have been wrong, but she certainly has not gotten the credit that's due her by the history books. Um, she should right. certainly be mentioned a lot more when we do our one month of uh, black history in February and somewhere between slavery and civil rights, um, Miss Claudia should be mentioned somewhere. You're right. And I, I think it is um, unfortunate that her courage and her defiance of a law that was on the books but that was wrong, she decided to stand up to. But mind you, Jimmy, as a 15-year-old, she decided to stand up against an unjust law in America in 1955. Now, it's real easy today to talk about in, you know, 2010, 2015, right. 2020, about what you're not going to do, or you couldn't have just, you know, sat back and done anything. A lot of people can say that, after civil rights legislation, yes. you know, after there was the first black president of the United States, after everything that's happened, you know, in the United States of America. But, Jimmy, this is 1955. 1955, this is Tom. Exactly. So this required an extremely significant amount of courage for a young lady of 15 years of age to have literally, as you would say, sit sat down to stand up to the rule of law, racism, prejudice, uh, to your point, um, afterwards, death threats. Uh, she ended up in the, ended up having to move to uh, New York City in 1958 because, of course, after that, no one would give her a job. She couldn't work any place. Mm. And, you know, it. it's amazing that this young lady had that much courage, even more courage uh, than her parents because, you know, again... Rosa Parks became the face right. of the Alabama bus boycott, and she became the face of, you know, what we call the fight for civil rights in the state of Alabama, but she had an organization behind her. She did. She had the NAACP behind her. This young her. lady did not. All she had was her conscience behind her. Well, Tom, you bring up a very good point. So I am thankful that she was not physically harmed um, when the powers that be decide to retaliate against her because she could have very easily have been attacked, uh, kidnapped, hung, killed, lynched, and um, the perpetrators wouldn't have been charged with anything. That would have been looked the other way. In fact, I'm pretty sure white society at the time would have said she had it coming because she refused to follow the rules. If she had just gotten Correct. up and given up her seat, this would have happened to her. So, uh, and see, talking about blaming the victim, she would have definitely have been blamed if something had happened to her. And the, and the interesting thing about this, Jimmy, and, and as it was then, as it is now, that's how cowards act. They, they do it behind sheets where their faces can't be seen. They do it in mobs. You know, you, you don't see one person going against one person. You see a mob 
you know, stringing up one person, whether it's a yeah. man or a woman, or a mob assaulting a young lady, or you see a mob making threats. They're invisible, but they're making death threats against you, your family, whether it's then or whether it's now. It's just cowardice. And this is a young lady who, at 15 years old, had more courage than any of those people. Yes, she did, Tom. Uh, in fact, I don't know this for certain, but I don't know if even that. <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know if the NAACP and the civil rights uh, leadership movement leadership at the time was planning something similar to this, or did they see this in the black press and got the inspiration and idea to do it on a larger scale where they can bring more attention to it by having Rosa Parks do it. Uh, that I'm not well, I'm not certain, but but it seemed like this young girl, this young lady teenager at the time should have been, okay, I know it was reported in the black press a little bit, but Tom, that still is no excuse that we allow her name to almost be uh, not written in the history books. Yeah, you know, it. there was some politics behind it. I mean, when you when you compare uh, Miss Colvin to Miss Parks, you, you have kind of a contrast in terms of what they represent. You had Claudette Colvin, who at the time, you know, was a teenager. Um, she was young, obviously unmarried, wasn't established. You know, she was a dark-skinned young lady or yeah. a brown-skinned young lady with kinky hair. You had Rosa Parks, who was an adult. Um, she was married. She was a prominent citizen in the community. Um, she was well thought of by the mainstream community. She had fair skin, and she looked like what Jimmy was called a more acceptable black person that they could build around uh, and that would be more palatable by not just the black community, but by no mainstream America as well in this fight for civil rights in Montgomery that built the foundation around the Montgomery bus boycott. boycott. So there, there was definitely some politics involved with this. I mean, I don't, I don't think you can, right is right and wrong is wrong, and I don't think there's a wrong here. It was, I believe, a politically motivated strategy behind the, the religious organizations, the NAACP, to select Rosa Parks as the face of this movement. Do you think if Miss Claudette was fair, light-skinned, that the same, that history would have unfolded the way it did, in the same way? Well, she had a couple of strikes against her. I think one is she was young, she was 15. And so, you know, well, building your, everything else was your the same movement except the color. around someone that age, that, that's one thing. You're right. She was dark skinned. So that that's another strike. Another thing that came out uh, about her is that she had become pregnant as a, a single uh, mother in her teenage years. And uh, from what is understood, she was actually impregnated by a, a prominent citizen in the mm. Montgomery area, who happened to be white and oh. who was married as well, by the way. So there was a lot of dynamics going on in terms of uh, their decision, who they made the face of this movement. Well, I understand that, but I'm just saying that with, it, with all things being equal, if, 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 the skin, if the color of her skin had been you know, three or four shades lighter, would history have unfolded the same way? Maybe, but I think she still had other strikes against her. That Even with the strikes, cool. but, I, but, I, but I do believe, Jimmy, then as in today, she would have been more digestible. It's sad, it is unfortunate, but it's the truth. Well, I mean, today there is no shame whatsoever in having a uh, child outside of wedlock. And, uh, you know, back then in the, in the 50s, you know, that was uh, still a serious strike against you for a young lady. And yeah. especially to be knocked up by a white person who's married. So you're really just a side chick. The, you know, I wouldn't even call you the mistress. Um, I mean, you know, because, you know, mistress at least have a status. You know, some right. some status and some rights, I guess, within the dynamic of a relationship. But when you're the side chick who's totally being kept in the, uh, in the dark uh, behind scenes... Um, then, uh, you know, that's a, that's a whole different thing. So, yeah, Zach, I see where that could have been problematic in, 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 at yeah. that time 
trying to make her the face of your movement with uh, this right. going it on. Was, you're right, because it was, it was a credibility issue. But at the end of the day, it doesn't take away from, what, does from what she did, uh, from what she represented, the courage that she exhibited, and what she meant to the movement, not just in the state of Alabama, not just in Montgomery, but throughout the country. Because what we also have to remember is that it was the federal case that started with her and four other plaintiffs that ended up getting approved by the U.S. I mean, by the U.S. Supreme Court that the segregation laws in public busing was unconstitutional. Yes. And even beside everything else, it was that case, the federal case, which was being uh, basically driven by Fred Gray, who was a, an attorney for the Montgomery Improvement Association, Browder versus Gale, uh, that challenged busing segregation in Montgomery that ultimately ended segregation in Alabama, also brought to a conclusion the Montgomery bus boycott because, you know, what most people didn't realize is that Rosa Parks' case was basically being tied up in the state courts. Now, you have to understand that people were boycotting the yes. busing system for over a year. And the question is, how long would they have been able to carry that on, you know, depending on how long that case was going to take? That is the Rosa Parks case. But this case is what officially ended busing segregation in Montgomery and the state of Alabama. One of probably the most important cases well, I mean, it was uh, nationwide. that we're not aware of was driven by this young lady and four other plaintiffs. I mean, I mean, ended nationwide. Um, so that ruling didn't just affect Alabama; it affected you know, you know any place in America where this uh, practice was uh, being conducted. So. Uh, Correct. So it had Correct. national implications. And another reason, Tom, that uh, we should have done more. Now, I don't know. I think you mentioned uh, to me that that you think that maybe there was a street named after her in New York. But yes, she should certainly be mentioned in the in the uh, Black History Museums. And we should certainly you know, we're doing our part to bring awareness, you know, uh, to her, what she did and the contribution she made for all of us and a sacrifice, but uh, more should certain more should certainly be done. So and we, we just can't let you know people who who paid a down payment for our benefit to be reaped in the future. Um, once again, we talk about people making sacrifices at that time, only see the reward being reaped by future generations. I mean that takes a, lot, a great deal of courage uh, for someone to do that, especially when there's nothing in it for them. But heartache and pain. I mean, look what she had to suffer through. If someone had right. told her that this was gonna, this was gonna be the way it turned out, the immediate future of her not being able to find a job, her having to leave her home, leave the people, friends, and family to go relocate in another city, um, or hopefully you know you're not recognized and no one knows you in order to uh, get a fresh start, she may have rethought the decision back then. But I'm glad she didn't. I'm glad she stood up for what she thought was the right thing to do, which was, and we need more young people who have that type of courage to stand up to even today against what is socially wrong. Stop going along correct. with the crowd just to get along. Correct, correct. And a lot of people, I mean, we, we, we look back at things and we glamorize it. I'm glad you brought up that point because, I mean, she herself, uh, this happened in 1955. The uh, the case uh, was, was finally... Um, or I guess I would say busing segregation was um, struck down in late 1956 uh, by the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, two years later, in 1958, she ended up um, relocating to New York City to live with family because she couldn't, you know, find a job or, or, or do anything to take care of herself. Uh, and so she ended up relocating to New York City and ended up becoming a nurse's aide and did that for several years and taking care of herself and her son. Uh, she had two sons, by the way. And, you know, what most people don't know, you know, Rosa Parks herself, she ended up having to relocate for the same reasons to Detroit in 1957 because, of course, um, no one would, would hire her. She couldn't find a job. She ended up relo relocating to Detroit in 1957 to uh, start afresh 
uh, because, of course, of the attacks of the cowards in Alabama mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah, very, very sad. Um, okay, with the few minutes we have left, Tom, let's... Um, We've added a couple of new books to our book list. Um, I'm just going to you know, read down the list. We have uh, The uh, Miseducation of the Negro by Carter G. Woodson. We have uh, Their Eyes Are Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, Malcolm X by Alex Haley. Uh, Uncle Tom's Children by Richard Wright. We have uh, Oxford T uh, Tales, one of my favorites, uh, by Charles Johnson. Uh, Before the Mayflower by... Uh, Laron uh, Bennett, uh, Souls on Ice by Eldridge uh, Cleaver, um, from the Baller, Balder Fowles, Anthony uh, Browder, I'm sorry, I pronounced his name wrong, the uh, Browder Fowles, yes, and then Invisible Man by uh, Ralph Ellison. So we will uh, be expanding the list, and of course, um, our top 100 is not going to fit on the screen. <clears throat> So when we get to the end here, we'll just scroll everything down as we add uh, new books. <clears throat> and of course, I'm, I'm hoping that the uh, you guys recognize the guests that we've had on this year and talked about. We have <clears throat> Madam C.J. Walker. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got something in my throat tonight, um, so I apologize. <clears throat> um, yeah, Tom, you got water. That's what I need. Um <laughs> <laughs> You keep your glass of water on you, man. Yes, uh, my, unfortunately, my glass is empty here, so um, I'll keep that in mind for uh, for next time. But anyway, uh, we'll keep uh, listing our, our featured guests uh, that we speak about and the books that we recommend. We certainly encourage you to go out and uh, read the books. These are the books that we have read and we highly recommend, and eventually we're going to come up with our top 100 books that we think all black people should read in their lifetime. And I'd like to, I think, add my one book uh, for this week, They Came Before Columbus by Ivan Van Sertima. Okay, we'll uh, get that added to the list. That'll be on next week's show. I do apologize. We did not have the hotline, the bed line, uh, in the studio uh, with me today. It's actually downstairs, and I didn't realize it until the uh, show started. And Tom, you were supposed to remind me. You were supposed to have the checklist. Of all the things you're supposed to go over to make sure we don't miss anything, and you didn't mention the uh, the phone for the uh, for the call-in line. But uh, next week, please, if you're interested in participating in the show with us, the number is uh, listed here: nine seven two four nine seven two two eight zero. Once again, the show is live from at nine p.m. Central Time every Wednesday. We are here, and Tom, do you uh, do you know who we have next week? Is it for the next person on our top 100 list, or do we have a topic for you know, next week? We, we are chiseling it down, but um, you know, for next week, we'll, we'll have something out pretty soon, and you can guarantee that it's going to be good. But you're trying to decide for about two or three uh, personalities that we'd like to decide on. I don't, I don't want to make a decision. We'll, we'll, we'll make be, a decision together. It'll be a little bit of a surprise. So, um, yes. So, so, yeah, so, so do us a favor. Please subscribe, like, and share. Let everyone know. If you want to participate, please call in next week. The number's listed there. We start taking calls probably around 9.05 as we get into the show. If you have any questions, comments, that will be your time to uh, to get the, to air it out. Uh, with that being said, Tom, I'm going to give you the last word to take us home. All right, folks. Uh, we want to thank you again for uh, listening to our show. Uh, we want to thank you for your support. Uh, we ask that you uh, keep positive energy uh, with us. And most important thing, understand your history. Uh, make sure that you understand your foundation before you go out into the world and make your mark in our community and across the world. We thank you very much again, and we will see you next week. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.